Hi, welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. I am Dr. Carl Goldcamp. Today we're going to talk about something I'm sure everybody thinks about at some point in their life. The older you are, certainly you think about it more. If you have older parents, you certainly think about it. But the fact is it doesn't have to do with age only, but that's going to be the category we're going to put this topic in. So the topic is Alzheimer's. The connection is going to be Alzheimer's and omega-6, Lionel Leic acid, otherwise known as omega-6. But before we get into that, I have to paint a larger context of Alzheimer's and about ketones in particular. So we're going to cover a little bit of that, tip of the iceberg. That might be a whole nother um, video to cover. I'm a keto naturopath, so this is where we started, was all about ketones. And to reference that and talking with Dr. Stephen Kinane, that I'll reference some of his work here today, uh, that also I had a podcast interview with him for uh, a couple hours, and I'll point you in that direction as well. Fascinating work, but let's get started to understand about Alzheimer's and what omega-6 ratio with omega-3 has to do with any of this. Okay, great. Okay, so Alzheimer's, as you probably know, it really starts with what we consider a hypofunctioning of, of the brain cells. And many people refer to it, and many medical practitioners and health practitioners refer to it as type 3 diabetes. Why is that? It's because it can no longer bring in, it's called insulin resistance in the brain, but it has a tough time being able to bring in glucose. So why is it would have a tough time bringing in glucose? Well, it's this decline has come after a number of years of elevated glucose. That's what brought in the insulin resistance. And so it down-regulated. It shut some of all the doors to the brain cells. And so when the brain gradually, at a higher concentration, you can shut some of those doors, still get adequate amount. But when the amount starts to decline, you get the hypofunctioning. It can't get the glucose. And it no longer has access to ketones, which is what you were born into, both in utero and through breast milk in your first six months to a couple of years, depending on who you were and how long you were breastfeeding. So this is pretty interesting. We're going to go into finding out how we can actually restore brain function to an extent with ketones and how we feel we can talk about that and be sure of that. Okay. About diabetes in general, we call what is type 3, what is type 2, what is type 1. Type 1 is an autoimmune condition that usually happens before birth, um, congenital, you might say, or genetic, or it might happen in the first couple of years, even the first decade of life. And what that is, it's an autoimmune um, disease, if you will, that has killed, closed down the beta cells in your pancreas and the other places in your body where your beta cells are. And so you can't produce insulin, and so therefore you're handicapped from birth or from a very young age. That's type 1. You just can't produce the insulin. Type 2 is what has been considered lifestyle-induced, and it, about 50 years ago, it was like the disease, the condition of older people in their 70s and 80s and 90s, but now it happens as early as one's teens, in the teens, and for the same reasons, because it's been induced by lifestyle with the food they've been eating. So 50 years ago, the food they were eating, yeah, it was high carbs and sweets and so on, but that has gradually become much more intense, much more acute, much more problematic, and it happens a lot earlier in life. And so what that is, that's about the processed foods. It's now hyper-concentrated those carbs. It's now hyper-concentrated these seed oils, these industrial oils in your foods, and it's stripped away the nutrition. So um, that is one of the, that's a global understanding of why it happens at such an early age. And type three is Alzheimer's, dementia. Okay, so how to achieve a metabolic rescue of the brain. This comes from um, the work of Dr. Stephen Kinane, one of his presentations that I've seen. And so what he shows here, and I'll walk you through it. First of all, a little bit of the understanding of the initials he used. This is called healthy young, healthy old, mild cognitive impairment, um, mild cognitive impairment with 30 grams per day of MCT oil, mild cognitive impairment with 45 grams, higher dose. And so MCT oil is C10 and C, C, uh, C10 and C8, otherwise known as caprylic acid. 
And you can get that in coconut oil or you can just simply get it online called MCT oil. So an MCT oil has been around for oh, 50 or 60, if not longer years, okay? So what he did here, what, what his uh, research clinic in essence did, was that they measured for young people, what is their brain cell ability to use glucose and use fat? So their ability to use glucose, which is the blue, was fairly high. And here's 100% functioning. The top here is 100% functioning. And so in order for, these are cognitively normal people. They took their test, you talk to them, they're all fine, right? <clears throat> but when they did his brain scans, PET scans on these, he found out that they had a decreased ability to use glucose. I mean, it, it got them within the, the energy they needed for their brain, the glucose and the ketones. But so that was a healthy young, still insulin resistance. So now healthy old, their ability to use glucose has dropped even further. And their the presence of their uh, ketones, which is really just a concentration in the blood, was even lower. So they're now clearly below 100%. And going even further, now we're seeing mild cognitive impairment. We're now below what they call the brain energy gap. That is, the brain is just not getting what it needs in terms of energy, which is either glucose or ketones. It doesn't have either. It can't make it. The functions just aren't being fueled enough. So now we go into adding some MCI. Um, yeah, sorry, MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides, what MCT stands for, at a fairly low dose, 30 grams per day. And now we see it, it's given some ketones. Now we have some functioning going on for these people who are just mild, co mild cognitively impaired. And then we increase that amount per day. And we, we actually got a benefit of showing that, wow, it's even, it's even better. Okay then, so this is across the board, speaks to how we have in younger people still have a compromised ability for their brain to use glucose and ketones. So glucose specific brain energy deficit precedes, precedes cognitive decline in conditions of increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a PET scan off to the side showing areas of hypofunctioning and what it's saying these people are all cognitively normal. You talk to them, they did their test, everything's fine. You wouldn't know that by how they had their life going or their tests and so on. The PET scan showed that they actually preceded, that they had a deficit that preceded the outward manifestation of cognitive decline. Notice that these people were with insulin resistance independent of age. So it was independent, yeah, insulin resistance was blocking, if you will, their it, their glucose from getting to the brain cells. Now here is a PET scan, two different kinds of PET scans. This is a glucose PET scan, which is what a PET, can, PET scan is. It's the uptake of glucose in the brain. So it shows control, which is normal brains, mild cognitive impairment, partially having problems, and then Alzheimer's disease, having great problems. So it shows decreased uptake of glucose is the point of this. Over here, it shows ketones, now, in the normal brain, the control group, they could get all the glucose they wanted. They didn't use a lot of ketones. They could. All the brains could use uh, ketones, but they had the option of using glucose. Now, we had mild cognitive impairment. What we're seeing is it's actually taking up more ketones. And for Alzheimer's disease, it's even taking up more ketones. So why is that? There's a need, obviously. They can't use. They've been blocked due to insulin resistance they've been blocked or decreased the amount that they can use on glucose. And, but their ability to use ketones has always been there. And their ability to use ketones or the ketones that are available for them to use is strictly dependent on concentration in the blood, strictly concentration. Whereas with glucose, it's a gated, it's gated, it's controlled by insulin. And, and other things as well. And so you have a whole independent rack of problems that can happen in terms of getting glucose into the cell because of the gates have to be approved. The, the receptors have to be opened in a special way where that's not the case with ketones. If the concentration gets higher, more ketones come into the brain cells. Higher, more, more ketones come into the brain. So that's how we're seeing, as we just saw, increased concentration gets increased functioning. Okay. Brain ketone uptake in a very high fat ketogenic diet. So this is where the whole idea came from. Hey, my fatty coffee, I had a 
my, my brain, I had mental clarity for a period of time. Fatty coffee leads to fat people, by the way. We're talking about mental clarity here. We're talking about brain function. So this is the pre-ketogenic diet, KT, the fatty diets. And this is afterwards. This is simply showing that the brain gets lit up. The brain gets its fuel. Now let's go on to the omega-6 and 3 ratio and put that in as a variable of Alzheimer's, right? So now we, talk, we just finished talking about ketones and glucose is a problem. Insulin resistance drops glucose. Ketones are always there. Get up the concentration. You have a, an alternative fuel that it can use. But that's not the whole story. All right, first let's start with children. They are not immune to this. This is not about old people only. All right, children, effects of fishy oil intake on cognitive and socio-emotional function in healthy eight and nine-year-old children in Denmark. is a Danish study. And they compared children on oily fish versus children on poultry. Why poultry? Poultry and pork, especially in the United States, I don't know about Denmark, are higher in omega-6. Why are they higher in omega-6? I think they're uh, innately higher, but mostly in the United States, states, they are fed soy and corn. And so they are fed high omega-6 food sources, and consequently, they have even higher omega-6. So it's really interesting that they took whole food sources of obviously oily fish, so we're speaking fatty fish of the Arctic, or the uh, North Sea, so to say, and poultry came out in 2020, so this is not old. Oily fish versus poultry. So what we're looking at is a lower score reflects better cognitive performance. So I just made these corners here to make it obvious. The lower right-hand corner would be the best outcome. The upper left-hand corner would be the worst. So if you were to draw a line right down from corner to corner, you would say worst outcomes over here, best outcomes over here, and that's exactly how you're seeing it. These dark triangles are the poultry eaters, right? Are they, uh, yeah, the poultry eaters. And these white circles are the fatty fish eaters. Amazing. So what they saw, dose response relationship between red blood cell EPA and DHA, which are your fish oils or your polyunsaturated fatty acids, and the overall cognitive performance score. So the lower the score reflects better cognitive performance. So you want them to be down here. So here you are. These are the best performers down here when looking at this side versus that side. Okay, omega-6-3 ratio in dementia or cognitive decline, a systematic review on human studies. So they reviewed 14 studies, and they showed a, su a supporting association between this ratio, 6 and 3, omega-6 and 3, and cognitive decline and dementia. And this review supports growing evidence of all their studies, a positive association between the dietary ratio of six, the dietary ratio, how much food had omega-6, had omega-3, not supplements, dietary, and the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Now we're getting into it. Okay, omega-3 fatty acids, potential role in the management of early Alzheimer's disease, 2010. This came from the University of Kentucky, by the way, and they started a whole department on um, aging back in the late 70s. So they were way ahead of the curve in terms of the rest of the country. So just mind your Kentucky jokes. All right, these data suggest three things. First of all, the dependence on the benefits of omega-3s in cognitive status. And those who had earlier signs of mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's showed the greatest benefit. Also, dietary omega-6 alters the omega-3-6 ratio, which you can just say, well, you, it's like a seesaw. You're adding into one side. Yeah, well, and may negate the positive benefits of omega-3 supplementation irrespective of the omega-3 intake. So what I'm saying is that by eating a lot of omega-6, we need a little bit. By eating a lot, it's going to prevent whatever omega-3 you are taking as a supplement from even having a benefit. You can't omega-3 your way out of this. You can't omega-3 your way out of this. A potential modular role for APOE, we'll get into that later. That's a genetic predisposition to some aspects of Alzheimer's. Omega-3 fatty acids and Alzheimer's disease, a Canadian study of health and aging. Okay, and they examined the plasma fatty acids of DHA, omega-3s to omega-6 ratios were lower in Alzheimer's. So they said omega-3, notice that, omega-3 
to 6 ratio were lower in Alzheimer's patients. You wanted it to be higher. They flipped that ratio around, by the way. This study was the first to suggest that the later studies, and later repeated it, that the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids may be negated, may be canceled by too much omega-6 fatty acid in the diet. I want you to get that point. Because people ask on all the YouTubes, how much omega-3 do I need? Well, this is saying you're not going to omega-3 your way out of this, honey, or sir, or ma'am, or whoever. It is estimated that prior to 100 years ago, Western people consumed about twice as much omega-6 as omega-3, two to one ratio. Currently, over 20 times as much omega-6 fatty acids as omega-3s are typical in the diet. I'll show you that that is exactly true by our client and patient population. All right, omega-6 acid linked to risk of Alzheimer's. This is 2012. A fatty acid, this comes from The Guardian in the UK, a fatty acid, an ingredient found in foods considered healthy, could harm brain cells and raise the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. A substance, an omega-6 omega essential fatty acid, is usually found in vegetables, fruits, nuts, and widely considered a vital element of a healthy diet. But tests by scientists in the US have shown that higher levels of arachidonic acid are linked to brain changes that are commonly found in Alzheimer's disease patients. Researchers measured levels of the chemical in the brains of healthy mice, as well as a group of mice bred to develop Alzheimer's-like condition. The most striking change we discovered in the Alzheimer's mice was an, increased, an increase in arachidonic acid and related metabolites in the hippocampus center of memory. And that's the effect it early that's affected early by and severely by Alzheimer's disease. They start to lose their memory, as we all know. So specifically in that area, we're saying the arachidonic acid built up. Okay, this is from California Gladstone Institute, neurological diseases, etc. So arachidonic acid is used to make the blood-brain barrier. It's a membrane that acts as a filter and protects neurons from potentially dangerous contaminants in the bloodstream. So there's a point to it, but to having too much, it actually goes on. Just because something's good, more is not. And that was 2012. Okay, in the US, between 2000 and 2019, up to a couple of years ago, deaths from heart disease have increased 7.3%. So the whole percentage has gotten worse. It hasn't gotten better, it's gotten worse. Not just more people, the percent has gotten higher. While deaths from Alzheimer's has increased 145% in that same 20 year period. Alzheimer's and dementia deaths have increased 16% during the COVID pandemic. So over the last year and a half in the United States, the rates of deaths from Alzheimer's increased 16%. And that's from the Alzheimer's web, web page. All right, here's some charts I want to show you to compare. I want you to, to visualize this because I'm going to give you a couple of these and I want to, I'm going to show you what I believe is responsible for this, a large degree. And I think you know where I'm going. Okay, this basically says three age groups, 65 to 74, 74 to 84, over 85. Obviously, the older you are, the worse the Alzheimer's goes up, but it's going up in each age group. Kind of the same curve you're seeing here. Same curve here. This was from previous videos I did, but I want you to know the guidelines that came out of those two studies that were proven false. The two studies were Minnesota Coronary Experiment and the uh, Sydney diet heart health study, they both said, you know, if we take increased omega-6, polyunsaturated fatty acids, that will drop our cholesterol. If we drop our, and we drop our saturated fats, our cholesterol levels in the blood will drop and coronary heart disease will decrease. Well, they were correct that the cholesterol did decrease, but the heart disease got worse. And actually death from all causes got worse in the Australian study. So the guidelines weren't just about low fat recommendations, they were specifically about low saturated fats. So what they did is in this recommendation, they dropped the saturated fats, which now it's a deficiency, and they increase your polyunsaturated omega-6. So they've had two problems exactly affecting the same outcome. In other words, if they didn't drop the saturated fats and added the polyunsaturated, it wouldn't be as terrible an outcome. Okay, here's the oils I'm trying to get you to see. Here's the 
Eisenhower time of all the heart attacks, which spawned Ansel Keys. And there's here's your soys going up. So we talk about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's was actually diagnosed first time by Dr. Alzheimer in 1901. So this is just back at the beginning here, probably the beginning of the chart. And so in these 90 years from 09 to 99, the per capita consumption of soybean oil, of soybean oil, not soybeans, of soybean oil increased over a thousand percent. Oh my gosh, over a thousand percent. Before that, it was um, cottonseed oil. Remember Crisco? That was actually came out of the 1850s, 1860s. That canola oil has come out of the late 80s. Here we go, the late 80s into the 90s. So it's really compounded that um, amount of omega-6 in our diet. Okay, just to review, omega-6, omega-3. Here's the fish oils coming in. Here's, they're talking about alpha linolenic acid. We'll get to that later. It's not a big contributor, way overestimated. And this is the omega-6. So this is a ratio we're looking at. When you dump in all the omega-6 over here, it drops down and it makes for more arachidonic acid. So that's why we saw the increase in the arachidonic acid for Alzheimer's. Eat this stuff, it makes more arachidonic acid. It accumulated specifically in the hippocampus. Memory was the first to decline. Okay, this is about obesity now, just rates of obesity, bird's eye view of the world. And so it's up here, it was started in the US, parts of the Middle East, uh, Australia, those areas obviously got worse and Canada joined us. And then parts, yeah, Canada joined us. Here's a local map being in the United States. I just want you to get the, the profile here. Notice that Colorado and Connecticut are the least obese, but just look at the dark. Now let's go to heart disease. Pretty much the same dark area, right? Pretty much the same two areas that plus uh, Vermont, New Hampshire. I grew up in New Hampshire, so. Okay, another epidemic is related as heart disease related to the imbalance of six and three. You can Google that. We'll go into that a little bit, but that's mostly for our subsequent video. I'm going to stay on track, but I want to show you it's related. And so is another epidemic that came out of this, and they actually are referred to. If you Google epidemic of these four that I'll tell you about in a second, you'll see that they'll come up. All right, it's heart disease. Roughly the heart disease map, there's the obesity map. They're pretty much the same one. Now, the Alzheimer's map from the turn of the century, turn of this century, 1999 to 2014, you see it brought it down to the county level, by the way, and the county level shows pretty much the same thing. You go, except for the Northwest, what's going on over there? Um, hard to guess, but I would say that probably has a lot to do with cloud cover. Here's what you call the uh, cas Cascades are here and the Olympic Mountains are over there, so they don't get much vitamin D until you get over into the Yakima Valley. Having lived there for about seven or eight years, I know a little bit about that area. My goodness, the coffee's there. Okay, so deaths due to Alzheimer's disease rose 55% between 1999 and 2014. That's not that long ago. That's huge. That came from the CDC. So really there are four different epidemics and they're called epidemics that are related to the high omega-6, low, omega-3 ratio, that's obesity, Alzheimer's, autoimmune disease, and heart disease. This is another Alzheimer's map. So this is a woman I want you to know, and you've, I've brought her in past videos, <clears throat> Artemis Simopoulos. She's now about 88, and she was on to seed oils 20 or 30 years ago, in the 80s. When people talk about, oh, such and such already covered seed oils, maybe they're new to you. This is the originator. This is a person who sunk their teeth into it and wouldn't let go. She's probably number one or number two in the world in terms of omega-6 and linoleic acid, right? And here's from her presentation. And I'll put that link in the, in the description so you can watch this presentation should you want to. All right, mechanisms of omega-6, omega-3 fatty acids. Linoleic acid inhibits EPA incorporation, inhibits EPA incorporation from dietary fish and supplements in human subjects. That's terrible. So you can't EPA your way out of this. You can't omega-3 your way out of this. Linoleic acid increases low density LDL oxidation and severity in coronary atherosclerosis. As the omega-6, omega-3 ratio decreases, gets healthier, so does platelet aggregation. What is that? That's clots. You have a tendency of having fewer and fewer clots or your potential. 
and you can measure that on the CBC. Okay, mechanisms of 6-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids downregulate the expression of genes involved in inflammation. In other words, they're anti-inflammatory and they're anti-obesity. People haven't heard that before. So omega-3 specifically by themselves is anti-obesity and anti-inflammatory. A lower omega-6-3 ratio, a healthier ratio, as part of the Mediterranean diet decreases vascular endothelial growth factor, which is associated with cancer and heart disease, decreasing linolenic acid. There you go, omega-6-3 ratio in chronic diseases. In the secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, a ratio of 41, that's a pretty healthy ratio, 41 of six to three was associated with a 70% decrease in total deaths, mortality. And a ratio of two and a half to one reduced rectal cell proliferation in patients with colorectal cancer. Whereas the healthy ratio of one to four, slightly larger, slightly higher, didn't have any benefit. So the lower omega-6 through ratio in women with breast cancer was associated with decreased risk. So what this says is, yes, it can be different how low you have to go on the disease you have. My guess is don't get the disease drop your ratios and don't get the disease. All right, the ratio of two to three to one suppressed inflammation in patients with rheumatoid arthritis as a ratio of five to one had beneficial effects on patients with asthma, whereas a ratio of 10 to one had adverse consequences. These studies indicate that the optimal ratio may vary with the disease under consideration. This is consistent with the fact that chronic diseases are multigenic and multifactorial. So again, my advice is drop the ratios. Don't do, be too picky. You're down to 10 to one. That's good enough. No, get down to get down to two to one if you can. Monitor it. Okay, prospective study for red blood cell um, polyunsaturated fatty acid on weight gain and the risk of becoming overweight or obese in middle-aged and older women. I'm just going to drop down to the conclusion. It's the women health study. So there's a lot of women involved in this. This is not a small study. It's a very big study. So it says in this prospective study, there is a suggestive evidence that red blood cells of omega-6 is possibly associated, associated with obesity and weight gain, whereas omega-3 fatty acid inversely associated with weight gain in its initially normal weight. Okay. So here, this is basically right off of my lab saying, this is the reality. We're not making it up. And this is the point that I want to bring you to. This isn't about, oh, this information is really interesting. I'll think about it. Go spend your $35, get this test done, find out where you are, do it initially four times a year, then two times a year, then once a year, and then you're on track. We'll get into that in a whole nother video, but I'm saying this is a reality. You can make it. It's not esoteric. You don't need any special, um, doctor to tell you, go get this yourself. You know what to do. This is real basic for a dramatically big change in your life. We're going to get into how to get your labs. People have asked about this. I referred to it. I'm just going to walk you right through it and what to do. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about next, the next lab that people want to know about is going to be homocysteine because the connection between essential fatty acids, your omega-3s, your omega-6s, and homocysteine levels puts you at dire risk and you need to know about that because it's another simple little test to get and a simple little thing you can do. That's to what your whistle in the future, so to say. All right, let me show you some podcasts I've done that you'll be interested in listening to and our Facebook group. Okay, so here's our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath, no surprise. I just want to show you the information. This is just on kind of a keto focus. We have another one on protein sparing modified fast, as you could well guess. Um, but this sort of shows the articles. Again, we're talking about omega-3 there. It's a whole different article. It has to do with neurological pain. It says linus, linoleic acid and omega-6 increases, leads to uh, insulin resistance. Well, there, I didn't mention that too much, uh, though it was kind of implied. And uh, nerve pain. And then we go, people report to what they eat. And more presentations we find people need to know about. Another report on elevated omega-6 polyunsaturated, polyunsaturated fats and nerve pain. And that's our 26th, 25th wedding. That's our wedding anniversary picture. So there you go. So now let me show you um, about podcasts. So this is called Buzzsprout. And what I want to show you is articles that have to do with articles, podcasts that I did on 
on certainly processed foods. That's current. But here's Stephen Kinane. I did a couple hour interviews with Dr. Kinane. After that, there's Chris Palmer on um, psychiatry and uh, keto. And we go on to other ways of taking care of of Alzheimer's, working with Alzheimer's relative to a ketogenic diet. So it's a resource for you is what I'm saying. So until next time, we got a few more topics to go over. Hope you'll be there. Bye-bye.